there's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. My guests today embody the definition of independent filmmakers. They find their projects, they find the financing for the projects, they create the marketing campaigns, and then they distribute their own movies through their company, Hidden Empire. I'm talking, of course, about visionary producer and executive Roxanne Taylor and her husband, writer, director, producer, Dion Taylor. Together, they have worked on projects Black and Blue, Fatal, Meet the Blacks, Meet the Blacks 2, The Intruder, Supremacy, and several others. From the moment we met, we were kindred spirits. I was in Rockefeller Center in New York City, walking from meeting to meeting, and it was the only place that was a central point where I could try to sneak in and find a quiet place to have this conference call with Roxanne and Dion. And I remember I was seeing the skaters and the <laughs> and the ice skaters and the shoppers, and, and I found this little alcove. And the moment we got on the phone together, it was kismet. It was as if we just loved each other from like the get-go. We shared this entrepreneurial spirit at our cores. And we also shared the same values of creating opportunities for people where opportunities didn't exist before. Please help me welcome Roxanne and Dion. I am thrilled to have you here today. <laughs> How are you guys? I know. Great. Applause. Applause. Doing great. What a great introduction. Well, is thank that you. Us? That is you. That's us. That is you. <laughs> so I want to take you back to a phone call a few years ago. Our mutual friend Damon Wolf called me up and said, you have to meet this dynamic duo. The energy, the positivity, the talent of these two people you must know. We scheduled a call. And I was like, I said, these people are my people. They're cut from the same cloth as I. And I wondered if you remember that phone call. I remember D setting up that call and, and going, damn, when are we going to stay on the call with him? <laughs> and, and I also remember on that same phone call when we spoke to you, the first five or I think I might have made a joke or something. The first five or six minutes was us just talking and laughing. We didn't even get into anything. So that was great. And guess what? You've been in our life ever since. I know, right? Ever since. You guys were so, like, had a your own way of wanting to do and conduct business. I so admired that. I thought it was just, like, so fresh and refreshing to hear. So, Roxanne, let me start with you and ask you, what is the mission of Hidden Empire Film Group? You know, I think it's evolved over the years. Initially, there was no Hidden Empire film group. It was just us trying to, you know, make a movie, you know. and Which we, movie was your 75 first? 75 was our first movie. It was called 75? It was called 75. They renamed it Dead Tone. Did you meet, like, were you a couple before you started working together? Yeah, we hung out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we were a couple. <laughs> we were <laughs> I've known Dion, what, 31 years now? Mm -hmm. About wow. 31 years now. So you both had a shared vision of doing what? And and out of that, I, I mean, guess the company was born. Yeah, I think we just loved movies. We love watching movies, you know, all types of movies from action to horror to, you know, drama, whatever it is. We just love movies. And we had our own kind of love for the movies. But I think ultimately... It was really important for us to make, obviously, whatever we wanted to, right, dope content, right, for the audience. Absolutely. But to also be able to give people opportunities in front of the camera and the behind the camera that we weren't able to have or get, were able to get in the beginning. You and know, when you we, say that, you mean people of color? Yeah, people of color. And African-American in particular? Uh, so Yeah, very sure. Well, yeah. it's totally important and totally unrepresented. We're doing a program with historically black colleges mm -hmm. to create a curriculum in the business schools 
in the field of market research and also in movies and entertainment specifically, in other words, marketing and market research in films and film and television, yeah. typically not an area that a lot of candidates of color enter. They don't even know necessarily that it is a viable option. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to change that narrative. That's right. That's amazing. I mean, access <clears throat> is everything, right? It really is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think we've obviously struggled with that a few times and we've found ourselves trying not to do that with people we hire, although we are loyal to, you know, a group of you know, a team of people that we've worked with. So we always try to make it our mission to bring not only interns, but, you know, people that just work hard. It's great. And have it's creative, great. create great. like creative vision. Sure. Dion, you have an infectious positivity. You happen to be one of my favorite human beings on oh, the planet. Man, don't get in here and make me start crying. No, stuff. no. Don't I'm, do that to me, man. And, no, I'm, I'm very serious. And, and you know, it's not like I need anything from you now. Maybe a roll. You can give me a roll. Yeah, I need a roll. No. Uh, no. Uh, dinner roll, mother. <laughs> dinner roll, mother. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to have that beeper going off now. I know. I see this is going to this is gonna oh, is devolve this quickly. I don't know. We, is this PG-10? No, no, no it's R. Uh, uh, with me, it's impossible. <laughs> but um, did you always have that uh, spirit? Did you always have that kind of true north or that light that mm. got people wanting to be on your team? Like, tell me about that because I'm so intrigued by you as a man. Yeah, you know? and I think I've been very blessed to to be a very positive spirit. I've, I've all, but but at the same time, being positive could also have negativity involved in it. What do you mean by I've, that? I've been in I've been in worlds where people see your light and they want to dull it. Oh, I've been in I've, oh, been, yes, in, I've yes, been in worlds yes, where yes. a basketball coach sees that you're something different and wants to bench it. Or uh, someone at your school is like, I don't like him because he always is loud and laughing. And so I've always had it, but I've always been able to understand later in life that you have to protect it. Do you know what I mean? The background, and I think I can speak for, for Roxanne and a whole lot of people. You know, I try not to get into this that much because I always feel like I'm like a broken record. I sometimes talk to my daughter, and we've had to have numerous conversations with our daughter and be like, hey, let me just tell you what it really is. You know what I mean? And well, sometimes we, and sometimes she'd be like, Dad, don't tell me no more. But I will say this. When some people can say, oh, yeah, I grew up in a very— tough place or I came from this or came from that. When you really, really come from a place where you did not know if you were going to eat tomorrow, Mm -hmm. when you really come from a place where, I mean, this is factual what I'm telling you, where you come home and you don't have any power or lights for a week and you have a parent that says it's going to be okay. And for some rhyme or reason, a week later, the lights are on. And for some rhyme or reason, the next day there is food. Then you adapt a positive energy. A belief. Yeah, you have to believe in something. Mm -hmm. And and you have to understand that it's going to be okay. Malcolm Gladwell, I just read this last night. I couldn't sleep last night. And uh, I, I slept for like four hours and I got up. So I was reading Brian Grazer's book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's called Face to Face. It's a terrific book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he talks about uh, his friend Malcolm Gladwell, who says that it's successful people. It's not something that is like huge talent that you have to have or some huge gift. You, it's seizing the opportunity mm-hmm. and undertaking that opportunity. I thought that was so fascinating. It's everything. Because I feel like I've done that in my life, you know, like Mm -hmm. I was bullied as a kid, like really bullied Mm -hmm. as being a gay man and growing up, uh, I buried it, you know, as we've all buried our, a lot of our dark secrets and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, That energy had to go somewhere. So, Roxanne, how has your um, success uh, and financial success affected you today as as a professional? Because... It's hard to be successful when you didn't come from that background, right? It's hard because sometimes you don't feel deserving of it or whatever it might be. You ever mull that one over? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm always just in competition, really, with myself and just trying Ooh, to be my best that's, self. That's, yeah, because you when you get wrapped up in trying to compare, like, well, how come they got this and I've done this and I've done that, but and they haven't and they're over here and I'm over there. It's just like, what are you doing it for? You know what I mean? And I've always just wanted to be better. And so when I get to that level where I'm thinking, Oh, I just want to do this and I want to be here. When I get there, I'm still never satisfied, right? So I just c- continue to create more goals and more well, dreams, I'm giggling, right? I'm giggling a little because I know you and am in awe of you as a woman who can juggle the number of things you can and still be standing. Yeah, I mean... I'm just Listen, in awe. I mean, it's, I don't even know how I do it sometimes. You but know, we, it's, but, it's it's tough. But so so what I want to say about the three of us is that we have, and we knew from that first five minutes going back to this whole mm-hmm. thing, we knew within that first five minutes there was a way that we connected. Mm. And I want to circle, but now I, 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 I'm finding a I think a neat way to get into what I really want to talk about now is this notion of shared experiences Mm -hmm. and getting away from uh, this notion of identifying people in buckets. Mm. Like we, the three of us, have very different backgrounds, uh, yet some issues that, you know, listen, your basketball was my dance, singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my haven, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roxanne, did you have something that you threw yourself into as Uh, as as a kid? I mean, I loved soccer, you know, but I was a school fanatic, school, 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 You knew school, grades school, were going to get you out of yeah, that was whatever my, you were in, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. But this whole notion of who sees your movies, who sees your content, mm. you know, I know that you have a concentration on the African-American community and on making movies uh, that principally focus on um, on black Americans. However... We know because you have – well, I know because I have an exit product that can tell you who actually shows up at your movies. Mm -hmm. They cross over more than uh, a lot of the industry wants you to believe. Mm -hmm. And there's so many commonalities and ways that we come together that I think it got us thinking about how – there's got to be a better way than bucketing all of Caucasians together, all of African Americans or Hispanics together. Asians together, you know, that kind Mm -hmm. of bucketing. And it doesn't, it's not just about race and ethnicity. It's about age. Mm -hmm. It's about gender. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about, um, it's about uh, finding the, the, the ways in which we are more alike than different and then marketing towards that. And I think that's what we share in this new entity. Would you, can you expand on that? Or would you agree with that? I, I mean, I kind of know that you do agree with it, but what would you what would you like to say about that, Dion? Um, yeah, I think that it's a big question, you know. It's yeah, a, it's a yeah. big topic. When you really peel it back and you understand, and I try to explain this a lot to people that are upcoming filmmakers and people that are trying to get into the film business. See, we got in the film business and didn't realize it was the film business. <laughs> we were just trying to make movies. <laughs> right. right. Then, then yeah. we had to learn, like, oh, shit. Like, this is like, damn. You know what I mean? There's contracts and paperwork and the people are, like, testing movies. And I didn't even know about testing until, I think, my third film. I was like, wait, what are y'all doing? Y'all going to play it in front of the audience and just see what they think, right? And I, and I didn't realize until I got that, to the That's room. a big part of the process. No, until they handed me five pages, and I was like, yo, what is this? And then I sat in the back and heard people be like, I hated it. Oh, my God. what was? And I was like, I was destroyed because I didn't. I only made movies because I wanted to make a film that I liked. Sure. I liked sure. it. You know what I mean? But I didn't realize someone's going to say, well, what did you think when she said this? And I'm But if you like, have a company, yeah, so, so, now you've so, got to start so, thinking outside of just what yeah. am I like? Right. So, yeah. so that's why I said this is incredible with you because now we get to educate people like, hey, man, there's a cheat code here where you can actually take your film, show it to people. And it's not a negativity thing. Right. It's like, yo, somebody's going to tell you how you can make your movie better for wide audiences. Well, works. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what I think is interesting now is the game field has changed. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly think that the AA audience, the African-American audience, 
was ever served to in past experiences with Hollywood. So what does that mean? When I was younger and I had the VHS tape of Predator with Carl Weathers and Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? And th- right in that group, no one in, in Hollywood was saying, I'm going to make that movie for a 14-year-old black kid that's living in the South Side of Chicago. No one, no one was like, okay, no. that's for him. No, no, they no. made a they they made that movie for a different audience. That's right. And then we captured it and we grabbed it and we pulled it in. And that goes on for 48 hours. Remember, Eddie Murphy came from Saturday Night Live. Saturday mm-hmm. Night Live was not an urban show. It no. was just a wide range, right? White show. He broke out of there, we grabbed him, and then that turns into what it needs to be. But this strange thing called culture started happening. And culture ends up becoming... What's that? What's culture, right? Culture is when something goes... No, I, mean, out, I know what it is. Right, but culture goes <laughs> when something goes outside of strategy. Yeah. Yes. When a group of people grab something... Zeitgeist. Almost. In the yeah. zeitgeist, exactly right? right? They yeah. grab something that we say that no one could ever write on a piece of paper and understand. So, for instance, what's culture? Bill Clinton gets on a show called the Arsenio Hall Show, who's the whitest president in the right. world, and he Wait. plays a saxophone. Yeah. And everyone goes, ah, he's dope. And we say we love him. And then the next thing is him running with some McDonald's. And then we go, oh, yeah, well, he's, that's our guy. That's culture. You, th- no one yeah. in the White House said, man, if you go in there and play the saxophone, they're going to love you. No, it just happened. And then we just grabbed him. And then he just happened to go to McDonald's. And we just happened to say, yo, we like McDonald's, too. And culture happens. I call them cultural cues. Th- that's exactly mm-hmm. right. You know? so, mm-hmm. so, and those are important. But don't get me wrong. When I talk about not strictly going off demographics, what I mean is demographics still matter, mm-hmm. but they shouldn't matter as the first and foremost area of entry. No, not anymore. And that's why right. I said this. That's why this is revolutionary. What we're doing is Correct. because what we're saying is what the old book used to say is wrong now. We're now the the way. We're the future. This is what it's going to look like. People are blended. Colors are blended. Lines are blurred. We will right? become a minority majority culture by 2043. That's right. Where there will be more minorities in this country than there are Caucasian people. It's already happened in the state of California, Hawaii, mm-hmm. I believe mm-hmm. Arizona, Texas, and D.C. For sure. And, and, it's and, just a fact. Yeah. And, so we and have that's to, the point. We got to embrace that. Yeah, yeah and, you have to, and you have to now learn how to test for people that are to just like that movie versus color. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So we got to get out of, oh, yeah, this is for an AA audience and this is for a white. Like, no. I know. Because the same white kid that you think is just a, a normal white kid is now the biggest Jay Z fan Absolutely. on the planet, and also Absolutely. is wearing the newest Nike Dunk. Absolutely, and that's been and, by right? the way, that's been that's been happening for the last fifteen years. Yes, but but they're and slow to understand that. Too slow to and understand. And vice versa, yeah. I've met young black kids that are in the punk and don't listen to rap, but loves anim- you know a uh, 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 Japanese animation. Sure, Kanye is a Japanese animation guy. Right. I, so I, so I, how I do just, you service him? I'm yeah. loving what you're saying on a lot of levels because what it does for me is the name a, of the show is hitting levels. <laughs> <laughs> what it what you it, can call it that if you want. What it says to me though is that we are finally turning a corner. Finally. Yes. And I have to say, I think it's the Me Too movement. I think mm. it's the Black Lives Matter movement. All this stuff. I think what's That's happened, and I think it's honestly I, and I, I'm not a big fan of the the gross sort of exaggeration often of the cancel culture because I think often it's, but that has made people responsible for what comes out of their mouths. You know, people are, yeah, I, 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 I don't like people living in fear. Mm-hmm. At the same time, a lot of us have lived in fear who were underrepresented for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it's about, to, I'm finally seeing in, because I travel the, Every day of my life or every week I'm traveling the country. I'm seeing what's going on in cities all around this country. I'm finally seeing an acceptance. I mean, Universal's, uh, uh, I'm working on a movie called Bros. It's a gay romantic comedy Mm -hmm. with gay actors Mm. with full-on romance and 
you know, sex scenes. Mm-hmm. It took all of that to get here. And like, yeah. and I don't mean gratuitous. I mm-hmm. mean the same that would be shown in a, when Harry met Sally or right, whatever right. it might be. Right. You know, yeah. I remember 35 years ago seeing a black and white uh, kiss and getting, still getting snickers, uh, snickering in the audience uh, by, uh, in t- certain parts of the country. Oh, no, you got, sure. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. wasn't even allowed on screen at one point. But I'm talking our, 35 I mean? years ago. It was yeah. still, it was 19, you know. Yeah, I mean, it still exists. 88 or 89. Today, you know. But well, we are we are growing. We I are growing. It, I know, I don't want to be Pollyanna about it. But mm-hmm. I'm saying now, now, so that then became 10 years ago, men on men kissing. Mm-hmm. Women and women kissing was more accepted, but men and men kissing was, and it's still a little bit in certain parts of yeah. the country. But I'm just saying that I feel like for the first time in my life, mm-hmm. I'm seeing a absolute change in perception and acceptance in a way that I've not never seen it before. I mean, we can go on and on about this. I just find, I hope our yeah. listeners find this as interesting as I'm finding it. Yeah, I think, but I think that this. This right here. That's a mobile phone. That's this changed. Mm-hmm. This changed the narrative of the world we live in, mm-hmm. and some good and some bad. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, you often have to completely tear the building down and rebuild mm-hmm. the foundation yeah. for yeah. things to. And so the last, the last five or six years, arguably, has been the world that we have known and loved is has been destroyed. Mm-hmm. And it is now in it's still being destroyed, but it's going to be rebuilt in a new way. And the rebuilding has been some of these atrocities that we've dealt with from the Me Too movement. I remember when that first started, I was like, man, this is crazy. Like hearing all the stories of how Hollywood operated behind this veil and people talked to women and what they did and brought them rooms. And, and you was like, man, that's crazy. And f- for a long time, Mum was the word, yeah. right? No one could say anything. Right. You bet not say nothing because you won't work. You bet not speak against right. that. So now that veil broke. And then when you mentioned the the Black Lives Matter movement, by the way, Black Lives Matter, we're not talking about an organization. Let me just be clear with that. We're talking about a movement. We're talking about a movement. We were screaming Black Lives Matter because our I lives know. matter, not a company that set up an LLC. But that's another. I don't podcast. think anyone listening to this <laughs> so, podcast no, but, is, so, <laughs> is has any question. No, about I got I got to make sure because because that's that's something that's dear that's to me. So thing. so now oh. you so now oh, you yeah. set that up, yeah. and then you see the world. You see a George Floyd, and then the world responds, right? So now you have all these young kids, black, white, brown, coming together. Truly understanding. For, listen for one great cause, and mm-hmm. I'll tell you what's crazy about it. And this is this this could be very controversial, but it's okay because this is what we have conversation about. I think that for me as an African American man or as a black American man, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel like for the first time ever, years ago we had this thing was like the Million Man March. I remember. And I remember Spike Lee made a movie called Get on the Bus. And it was about a group of black men going to the Million Man March. And the Million Man March was all set up and built around black men and women and people coming together, all together to say, hey, enough is enough. We're tired of all this stuff that's going on. We're tired of racism. We're tired of just everything. We're just fed up. It's boring. Right? Here, here's <laughs> right. the issue that we learned 30 years, 25 years later. Right. It's not about us no more. It's not about us having a conversation. It's not me me and Roxanne having a conversation about racism no more. It's about us having a conversation with you about racism. And what I think this last movement did for us was very simple. My dad was in the Vietnam War. Two terms. If he goes and gets shot on the battlefield, He's laying out there bleeding and, and die. You've seen the cool war movies where you can't go out there because a sniper shoots you, right? Mm-hmm. Does he care what color that person is that's running out there to bring, drag his goddamn body back over there to help him? Is he going, no, send a black dude. Oh, what, about, what you do, send a black dude. Like, no, you dead on the battlefield. Like, you get shot. I, Asian, Arabic, Mexican, I don't care what you are, come get me. And And I felt like 
that is a very good analogy of like black people in America right now. We're like, yo, we land on the field and we keep being like, yo, black people come. Like, no, we need everybody to help. That's right. We need everybody with a uniform on to jump in and help because guess what? That's it's, why allies are so it's important. It's one yes. team. It's, look, ally, look, and that, I'm going to take it over here. It's that much important for film in Hollywood. Oh. For black people, I know our little. I want to. I, I like to say our little. What are we doing? Our little circle, that, yeah. right? But, of but the world. That's what right. What can we do? This, but we're doing it, and that's what I'm saying. Look at this, and and look. It would be very easy for us to be like, man, we just gonna go make our own movies, and we're gonna be black, and we're gonna make sure everything is black. And like, no, our job is to create allies, get in the sandbox with everybody else, mm-hmm. work with everyone else to create more opportunity, and then inside those great opportunities, bring up more people. Mm. Because I can't make a movie with just, oh, it's got to be just everybody. Like, yeah, that's great. That sounds great. But we live in a world, man, where when I walk out the door, everybody is a different color. So we need to make, that's why our films reflect that. I was just going to ask you, Roxanne, when you get, I mean, how many, no, no, no. no. How many pitches do you guys get, like, a week? You get a ton of pitches. There's, you can't count. You can't count. You so can't count. how yeah. do you get to the place of choosing a project? How does it work? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Did you rehearse that? Because <laughs> that's a hard one, right? I mean, I think so far we've just, again, like we, you know, it's the film business and we have been learning the business, right? And not just trying to figure out what movies we're going to make. Because we always, as Dion said, make the movies we want to make. Someone listening wants to say, I love these people. I want to be in business with them. I want to pitch a project. What do they do to get the pitch heard, first of all? I hate to say this now because I thought I'd never will. Reach out to our agent and manager. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Reach out to your agent call and manager. Call Omar. Go. Omar. I'll call Omar, who's sitting in the back, by the way. Wait. Oh, I, I don't know what he, he's actually. I think he got up to have a uh, refreshment break or something. No, listen, you can oh access God. us so anytime. No, no, you know what I, what I mean. But, but what I it's mean is, really assuming they can get through the the barrage and entourage <laughs> of folks of that you have helping you. What about once you get the project, and what are you looking for? Like what? turns you on. I interviewed yesterday uh, Sean Bailey, who's president of Disney. And I said, Sean, what is it that gets you to a green light? He says, someone will call me up, a major producer, and say, I want the rights to Sleeping Beauty or Mm -hmm. Snow White. And Mm -hmm. we're not giving them. What I want to hear is, what's your take on it? Mm-hmm. I yeah. want to know the exact way you're going to undertake it. Well, he says, they do, they're do. they in development with maybe two different versions of the same project in full-on development mm-hmm. to see which one resonates um, uh, the strongest. And I think that's sort of brilliant. So, Well, you do have to have a new take if you're remaking, right? You, no one wants to see the same Cinderella movie over and over and over, right? Well, they know they, like, have, they have, but you don't have a lot of but intellectual we, property. I, yeah, you're like, creating your own. Yeah, I mean, I love original content personally. I mean, it changes all the time, right? But I really love inspirational stories. You know, I love social impact stories. Okay, that becomes much more specific then. Yeah, I love action. You know what I mean? Were you anything that when you go to the movies for an hour and a half where you forget every single thing that's going on in your life and you are in that movie? That's interesting. I also want to say that you have tremendous social reach that you were um, certainly aided, if not were responsible for, like 850,000 black voters registering yeah. in the last election. That has weight, you know, that has gravitas. Mm-hmm. And I guess my question is, does that mean you wouldn't do a documentary? No, it doesn't. Or we something do, like that? Yeah, we'll do anything, you know. We'll that do would any- be fall under the inspirational, potentially, area. Yeah, education, you know, I yeah. think more because with the Be Woke Vote Initiative, um, you know, outside of how we personally feel, mm-hmm. that was really just to educate the youth on the importance of voting, mm-hmm. not who you're voting for, but why it's important. And it starts locally, obviously, 
you know, the presidential level is not the only voting mechanism, right? No, it is not. And and where you see the most results is locally. So that's what we push on, Mm -hmm. right? And that's what leads up to, right, who's selecting ultimately our president. Do you ever ever develop your own projects from your own heads um, or are you pretty reliant on spec scripts or ideas that that come to you? No. Everything has been developed from this that brain head, of, head over here. Yeah, yeah, that that bobble the, head over there. <laughs> like every everything yeah. has been original from Dion. So I think I think the question wow. you're you know? asking us is in reverse because let me, I'll answer it in reverse. Please. Where most production companies would start and say, "All right, we're open for business. We're looking for scripts and ideas and we want to actually get out there and go make this stuff." We unfortunately were not um, able to do it that way. Our business started from ideas that I had. Every movie that we have ever made is my movie. Wow. Every every wow. film you've ever seen has been me and her or me going, man, this is dope. And then it evolving into something. Mm-hmm. Now there were there And then you'll bring writers on, let's say. Bring a writer on or bring a you group write as on. well. Yes. So everything has been us building that way. Now, here's what's crazy. This looks cool now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it looks cool. Roxanne with the white thing, and we in here, and I got this polo on. And it's like, man, they, they did that shit, right? right? But the reality is, when we first started, because we are film fans, because we are people that live really in the culture, we really bought tickets and really went to the movies, right? Like, this is not like, oh, I went to film school, and now I'm going to be a director because I know how to shoot a cup of tea really well. You know what I mean? Did like, you go to film school? No, you? I'm self-taught. But I'm self-taught because I love cinema, right? So well, I, how did you learn how to do such a great job with actors, for example? Now, I'm going to tell, tell you, let me just tell you this. Those <laughs> movies yeah. that we made when we first started... Were master's degrees. It was everything. Right? But, that was but, our film school. Yeah. But, part of, but yeah. part of why people did it. not want to deal with us is because I have been told early on, like, you need to focus on one particular movie that you're trying to make. Who are you? What are you as a filmmaker? Yeah. Right? So we came out the gate with a horror movie. The reason we made a horror movie early on... Was that 75? That's 75. Mm -hmm. But the reason we made the horror movie early on was because, number one, we were horror fans. But number two, when we looked at making a horror film, business-wise, it was the right decision based on the fact that what, Kevin... In a horror movie, you don't need stars. Your killer is the star. Mm -hmm. So I could put a guy with a plastic bag on his head, and that is now the movie. Right. Okay? So if you're thinking creatively, you go, oh, wow, like I can get away with it. You don't know anyone in Halloween. Now you do. (laughs) You know what I mean? So so that was the initial idea. But then when you jump from making 75 and Chain Letter and the earlier movies we do, and then you go to Supremacy. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Who would have ever let me have a script like that, right? So when you get to now a drama with Mahershala Ali, Danny Glover, Joe Anderson, Don Olivier, a true story about a white supremacist out of the Bay Area that stops a car and kills a police officer on the road and takes a house hostage. That is so far away from 75, right? But then if you look at our body of work, we've been able to jump genres and part of the thing that we love seeing that we're doing is I've modeled my career after Steven Spielberg. I've always felt like... Right, you're not pigeonholed in a genre. In nothing. That's what Roxanne was just saying. In yeah. nothing. I like, there's a theme, and I think you'd find Steven saying the mm-hmm. same thing, inspirational stories, mm-hmm. stories yeah. that move, stories that change the narrative, and stories And ours is adversity. Educate. Yeah. Getting getting over, every overcoming. Movie, every Sorry, movie is the, right? we have is that made yeah. is about yeah. overcoming adversity from horror to even drama the, the to even story. crazy next door neighbor meet yeah. the blacks it's about family it's about family and yeah. adversity yeah yeah and that is so interesting again in brian grace's book yesterday tell he, brian i said what's happening i will i, I will <laughs> tell brian i said i'm free I'm I, I will but you know brian he, he talked about how he was pitching um what was that mermaid movie he initially did splash splash oh, and he couldn't movie. get anyway he said he was pitching it for great five movie. years love whatever it was and same way, like the definition of insanity, expecting a different result by pitching it the same. Finally, he realized 
this is about something else than mm -hmm. a mermaid. It is, yep. and so he got the essence, mm -hmm. and he went in and he sold it to Disney. Yep, like because he everyone was. It was about a guy who was just wanted love of his life from Long Island. Man, who, that's right. And changed the narrative and went in there and and sold sold the the picture. And yeah, I thought, amazing. and so he's since then has done that. His whole career, yep. and I would say, arguably one of the five most successful producers in the business. Of all time, and uh, yeah. and so it sounds like you approach it the same way. You're finding the essence of what makes this a common thread. Yes. You know, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll pick it up. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of, and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology, by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never-before-revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of Audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster, available now. We're back and so excited to continue our conversation. So moving on to the, when you finally make a movie, now you're screening it for an audience and I get involved or my company gets involved and, uh, and you're testing it. What have you learned from uh, <laughs> the, the process? Uh, oh, you're shaking your head. No, I was saying it was, it was, it was the first time you said it was painful. Yeah, yeah, well, actually, there was the first time was we we didn't do that. We would screen it for friends and family, thinking this is our test screening. We well, didn't even, you know you what want, I mean? Because we didn't scrappy, know. Sometimes you that's know? what you do, you know. But yes, go ahead. But you got to think yeah, that friends that, and family are not always going to be no. Honest with yeah, you. yeah. No, I mean so, the the te this this world, you know, the screen engine world, and and what that represents, and that like opened up so much for me yeah. as an independent filmmaker it, it just it just, look it it really allows you to understand like what how people perceive your material yes right and sometimes what i learned is sometimes even what you write on the paper does not translate to what's happening oh in the god. theater oh my god well you're 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 absolutely uh repeating back, parroting back what Ron Howard says. He says, I get to choose my script. I get to develop it with the writer. Mm. I get to cast it. I get to shoot it my way. I get to edit it my way. And then I show it to an audience. And guess what? What I've communicated to the audience may not be what the audience is getting. Mm. And I got to listen. As I like to tell people, if someone hunks at you on the freeway, you know, they're an asshole. Mm. They're a jerk. If five people hunk at you yeah, on the freeway, wrong. you're the asshole. Yeah. You're the jerk. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's exactly right. So that's you right. need to listen. Listen. And not just be defensive and say, okay, how can I... Re so what was the biggest change that ever happened in a screening for you guys? I'll tell you. That's what I was going to tell you. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So Damon Wolf takes The Intruder and they go set up a test screening for this movie. Now, the movie is playing crazy already. Like, it's just our edit. Mm -hmm. It's just our movie. And we've been playing it for people. And people are like, oh, man, this is crazy, right? Like, people are screaming. Two people in the theater like, yo, this is amazing. So Sony comes and says, yo, we want to, like, we're really interested in buying the movie. So I'm like, all right, well, great. Let's have them buy it. What's, what's the deal? <laughs> so then they say, well, no, hold up, time out. We're going to go test it. And that's when the first I was like, wait, y'all gonna do what? Like, cause now I'm going like, oh no, because if they well, I don't know accountability. I don't know what the on. test right. is gonna yes, be, I right? Understand. So they set up this test, and I remember I was like, yo, I'm a fly. I was like, no, I'm not gonna fly out there. I'm not gonna go to the test because I don't wanna be in the room, because I had a bad experience in the room the last time. So a few people I know go to the test. Damon Wolf is on speed dial with me, and I have three other people in that room that they have no idea is talking to me every beat of the night. I mean, every five minutes. Do you know, this is what just happened. They so, laughed at this scene. So the movie comes on. <laughs> Love that. And as the movie comes on, it is playing, and I know all of the beats of the film. I know when they're supposed to laugh. I know, what, because I have been screening my own movie. You bet. So they're going, so they're going, oh, man, it's working. It's working. Omar's in the crowd. He said, oh, man, that part worked. So when he gets to the 30-minute mark, and he texts me, we have the first hit 
And it goes, I know people are supposed to go, oh, hell no, because something happens at the 30-minute mark, which is the man comes, Dennis Quaid knocks on the door and asks to come in the house, and she basically lets him in. And I, like, and, no! And, I said, and he said, and he said no. Right? Yeah. And he says the whole theater said, no, don't you do it. Right. Now, here's what happens. The end of that film, I'm getting a text like, I can't even hear. People are talking over the screen, talking over the thing. So I'm going, oh, yeah, it's a wrap. So now when that movie finishes, Sony is in that theater. They're texting me now going, let's get the deal closed. There's no results yet. Mm. But what they heard, what they seen was it was an interactive experience for yeah. audiences. Yeah, they were through the roof. Now we got the results back from the test. It didn't they test did. well. Yeah. It tested cool, but it was like a low, not, it was not great. But the experience, yes. they were going, what happened in here? Right. Maybe we had the wrong audience, <laughs> but whatever it is, that was it. So we made that, they they never ever tested that film again. They bought that movie and that was the cut we took out. Now, oh, my other experience is yeah. this with testing, which I'm a, I'm a fan of it now. How about a change you made? Yeah. yeah. Black and blue, my director's cut, we tested it tested a ninety eight. That's the movie they put out. There was one adjustment in the in the in the in the screening in the uh, From test the, as a result of the screening results. Yeah, it was one. Was it was it? one thing. What was they it? was like, "Hey, when Naomi Harris looks at the that little girl, you cut away. I wanted to see her look at her." And yeah. I went, "Oh, that's easy. We could do that, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, done. But, yeah." But but I said, "Really, that was the only adjustment." That was For two. That was blue. two slam dunks. That's what I'm yeah. saying. That was yeah. two slam dunks yeah. versus. The atrocity that we had with, with one of our films, um, Chain Letter. Chain Letter. Dude, Chain Letter. I, I was didn't like, know Chain Letter. Dude, I made this movie, Chain Letter. They touched the movie, and it, I thought. It was rejection? I thought when rejection. I went outside, they was going to kill me. Page to page. Was it a DNA problem, right? It would have been a DNA problem? It was Structurally, it, structure, everything. That's what I mean. Everything. It's, 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 in the, it, it's in the makeup, there the was fabric holes, of what. Yeah. Because it was a misstep. You knew it going in. I bet you. Yeah. I have Hold on, am I right or wrong? I knew 100%. You knew, you mm-hmm. knew that script was not ready to go. Yeah. That's why I shoot the way I shoot now. Graduate school? Yeah. I shoot the way I shoot now because yeah. I shoot off the page. Yep. So in other words, I write the script, have mm-hmm. the script, yep. but then I'm also band-aiding in the, I'm like, oh, shoot this extra. Sure. He's editing. Yeah. I love it. So you're doing all some things too when you're shooting? Do it all. Two I mean, end, you're doing, three, you're taking all Oh, connect. three endings. I love it. I love it. Two different beginnings. Okay, yeah, because I yeah. want to ask you something before we break, because we could talk for hours, and I knew this was going to be the downfall. But we, this was a, this was a deep interview. This was a usually not the the fluff of what do you, um, what do you, uh, what do you value as? <laughs> Did the you most like our interview? Thing. Did you like it? Oh Lord, I, I'm <laughs> I'm loving this interview. Uh, I don't want to end it. I think you're going to have to come back down. But what I want to ask you is this. So you got a young person listening to this podcast because a lot of students listen to this. You had he asked that question, you mean? Is no, no. I'm just laughing. <laughs> crazy. He doing, I'm just laughing at him. He knows the answer, you mean? He knows all the answers. No, I don't. He doing the inner. He doing the podcast. You doing the podcast. <laughs> I was about to say, do you bring this into the bedroom too? Or is it? does it end? No before comment. You... <laughs> okay. All right. So, all right. Let me ask you this, though. Um... Young filmmaker, maybe in film school, maybe not. Um, they really, like you, know they love film. They want to get into the business. Give me the sage piece of advice mm. to them. Roxanne. Give it to She does I mean, I, I, <laughs> do this well. I mean, I do think education is important. Give it to them, Roxanne. Right? I mean, I, I think, mm-hmm. you know, you learn a lot in school. What does that mean, I, though? I don't. Edu- I, what does education mean to you? I mean, education is everything. College education? Well, if we're talking about film, right, film school can be important, right? I don't ever want to detour anyone from what they think is the best route for themselves because you can learn a lot in film school, and there's a bunch of exercises that they take you through. But for me— The fundamentals. The fundamentals of film, right? And they'll teach you movie magic, depending on what you're— You know, they'll teach you the softwares and all of the things that you— would need to have to prepare yourself. Got it. But I didn't go to film school either, and there's no better experience than on the job experience because all. Did you go to the, college? I did, but so I was a computer you, science major. But do you think you need to be 
Do you think you need one needs to go to college? Yeah, I, I do. You do. I or some vocational, you know, school. I, I'm or, with you because I of totally the. If agree. nothing else, it's the today it's, at least. Yes. It's the evolution of the growth of just evolving as yes. a you know yes. as a as a human being. Yes, you know, especially if you're writing, right. I mean, all of to, those layers. To understand layers, what the world is about. For sure. I mean, you're growing. I mean, I think the whole education process from elementary to junior high to high school yeah. to college really prepares you for the world, right? Any, any of your kids? How many kids do you have? Three. A girl and two Five, boys? Five, eight, and 17. Two boys and a girl, yeah. And any of them want to be in the film business? Um, they're intrigued. My daughter loves fashion. She's super creative. I don't know if it's going to be specifically like a designer, film, maybe. designer yeah. photography, uh, you know, those kind of writing, oh, creating. That's wonderful. But, you know, there's people in school. This business is very unique. Yeah. And you have to have thick skin and you have to constantly motivate yourself, you know. And so if you go to school and learn these fundamentals, it does not prepare you for being on set. It's a totally different beast. And so it could either make you or it could break you. And you started your own distribution company to once again do things your way, control your story, your narrative, which I so admire. I can't <laughs> express to you. I work with people all the time. And there was a time when I first said to you in that first conversation, branding is really important to stick with a genre or that an area and you all didn't buy into that notion. I think I'm right when it comes to most people who don't have your vision or your independent financing, which you've, you know, been lucky enough to, to um, lucky, uh, lucky when, when, op when opportunity meets preparation, mm. yeah. uh, to have aligned mm. yourself with folks who can, you know, finance your movies and give you that autonomy. But... I have a mantra uh, that I'd like to share with you and just as a final get your your comment on this every movie and I mean every movie if made and marketed for the right price should make money every single movie I agree with you yes most people don't understand what they have so they overspend mm -hmm. and they certainly overpay for marketing mm -hmm. and they just don't get it so I think that's a great way to tease the audience on a potential sequel for you guys to come back. Mm. Let's do it. I, mm. uh, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I just can't thank you enough. Um, can't you thank know, you enough, I have Kevin. to say, truly and utterly, I love you guys. I think you are extraordinary human beings, talented and extraordinary filmmakers, and I'm honored to be in your uh, inner circle. Thank you for allowing us to be in your circle. Mm -hmm. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Dion and Roxanne are very active on social media, and I encourage you to follow them. Also, to learn more about their upcoming projects, check out their website at hiddenempirefilmgroup.com. For other stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or wherever books are sold or through my website at kevingets360.com. You can also follow me on my social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, we will welcome the enormously successful producer, Neil Moritz. Until then, I'm Kevin Getz, and to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being a part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.